The American Revolution had many fathers, but today's guest paints a picture of Samuel Adams, the cash-strapped publisher and political leader from Boston, as perhaps the essential founder whose spirit and maneuvering shaped so many of the seminal events of the Revolutionary Era. She's Stacey Schiff, this week on Story in the Public Square. And welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. And I'm G. Wayne Miller, also with the Pell Center at Salve. This week, we're joined by Stacy Schiff, a Pulitzer Prize winning author whose new book is The Revolutionary, Samuel Adams, a gripping account of the Bostonian who may very well be the most essential founding father. Stacy, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm delighted to join you both. You know, I, so uh, readers uh, probably know you from your other critically acclaimed work, Vera, which won the Pulitzer Prize, uh, the uh, uh, a biography of, of, of Saint Exupery, uh, which was a Pulitzer finalist, another biography of Cleopatra, other books about the witches of Salem and Benjamin Franklin. What led you to Samuel Adams? It wasn't in part the fault of the book on the Salem witch trials. I had finished that book and I was thinking a lot about what courage it takes to make a real moral stand. I was thinking about the first people who expressed skepticism about the witchcraft court. And I was looking, it was 2016, I think I was thinking a lot as we all were about the fundamentals of democracy. So I was really looking for some figure who had actually been on the scene early on and who took that kind of unpopular moral stand or who took a really strong um, stand in defense of American values, what we today consider American values. And both of those roads led um, sooner or later to Samuel Adams, who his, who's, who is in all of his contemporaries' estimation, the man of the hour and whom we had largely forgotten. But if you read the 18th century sources, it's Samuel Adams and George Washington who affect the revolution. Who, so why have we forgotten about Samuel Adams? And we should, we should stipulate up front, as you do in the book, nobody called him Sam. <laughs> As a friend of mine pointed out, people might have called him all kinds of things that we don't know. <laughs> He's, he tends to be run down by his enemies in the, in the 19th century, and to those men, he becomes Sam. He seems always to have been Samuel. In his day, he signs himself Samuel, certainly. And he falls out of the scene for a lot of good reasons. In, in the first place, he's, unlike his cousin John, with whom he operates quite closely he's a very um, modest man he comes from that you know great new england line of um, people who prefer to melt into the background who aren't terribly vain who don't claim undue credit for their work so he in part dismisses himself from the scene but there's all the more incentive obviously to do that when you're fomenting revolution the idea here is obviously not to leave too much of a paper trail not to leave fingerprints and a lot of that is erased john adams leaves us this marvelous account of watching his cousin Samuel feeding his papers to the fire in Philadelphia so that none of their none of their friends will be compromised by their by their revolutionary activities. And also the world diverges from his world. He's he's very much a creature of old New England. And as the as the new America rises and races toward wealth and opulence, this sort of austere, austere, very sort of puritanically minded man falls out of the picture. So you describe him as the patron saint of late bloomers. What was he doing before he quote unquote bloomed? N not a very great deal. Uh, I don't know why, but I find that terrifically endearing that for the first 40 years of Samuel Adams's life, he, he runs up a great number of debts. He works at a series of sort of modest town jobs. Um, he runs his father's business into the ground. And his mind is clearly utterly dedicated to politics and to the body politic. And he is transfixed even long before anyone has come to really talk about them by the question of liberties. So that in the early 1740s, in the late 1740s, he's writing a great deal about rights infringed and the enormous importance of having uh, the power of government in perfect equipose with the power of the people and that that equation should never be disturbed. And this is long before anyone is really infringing any kind of American rights, long before Great Britain has passed any kind of heinous legislation. 
So what, what brings him to prominence finally? When does he quote unquote burst onto the, the public scene? I think by most accounts, the Stamp Act is what ushers him to center stage. Um, the Stamp Act obviously is met with indignation throughout the colonies. Massachusetts is out in front in terms of um, violence, in terms of street violence and street theater when it comes to the Stamp Act. And Adams is front and center. The Stamp Act is really what moves him, but elects him to the House of, to the Massachusetts House of Representatives. He's out front and center in helping to burnish some of the Massachusetts responses to the Stamp Act. So he's he's working as kind of accomplice and, and editor to various friends who are already in government positions at that time. You know, you mentioned uh, the moral courage that you that you started thinking about as you were as you were working on the Witches of Salem. Where do you think Samuel Adams's moral courage grew from? That is such a, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Why do some people have that firm moral compass? He, the family suffers a very early setback because of a piece of British legislation. And based on his father's response, based on the few clues we have about his father's response to that legislation, which bankrupts the family, my guess is that he does not hail from a family of, of shrinking violets. My, my guess is that there's a, there's already sort of a, a staunch stance toward authority built, you know, sort of baked in. Obviously, it's a very, um, it's a very New England position as well. But he is unwavering, idealistic and unwavering to a degree which I think surprises everyone, even his closest friends. And I think that at a time when other people are willing to sort of pack up camp and sort of say, okay, we've resolved this issue, now back to business. Adams is still insisting um, always, his eye always on the prize, on resolving this question of who is going to determine the fate of, of the American colonists. Is that going to be us here in the colonies or is that going to be London? And he and that for that sort of determination, I don't really have a I don't have a winning formula, but it's it's very much there and it's astounding. So the city of Boston was restive long before the Tea Party. What was the relationship between the city of Boston and the Mass Bay Colony during that time period? So Boston itself is generally a, a little bit out in front of the rest of the colony. It, it begins over these revolutionary years as the more disruptive, um, the more tumultuous place. There, there are all kinds of protests. There are various... Um, various collisions with with imperial authority whereas the countryside is much tamer and that's a rever that's a, an equation that will begin to reverse itself largely through the work of adams um so that by this early 1770s um certainly by lexington and concord the countryside is much more radicalized and the town of boston is a tamer place yeah stacy i uh i teach a little and i struggle sometimes to convey to my students uh, just how exciting the ideas of the Enlightenment were in the middle of the 18th century. And then I come to the account that you offer of the Advertiser, uh, the first newspaper that Adams helps found, uh, and the way he engages in those political discussions in that era. If you're talking to students, how do you convey just how exciting and powerful ideas were at that moment in history? You know, it, it's it's such an exceptional thing, isn't it, that he's got his mind around those ideas at a time where there would have been no there would have been no illustration of them really for him to look at, except on the page, except in the pages of John Locke, which indeed he seems to have swallowed whole. You know, I think I would probably point up the par the modern parallels. I mean, today, for example, I think it's very hard to read about China without also thinking back to some of this, some of the Boston street theater, to some of the um, some of Samuel Adams's tactics in in Boston. Um, it's thrilling stuff, and these are resounding anthems, which, and he, and he, I think, polishes them to be really evocative lines. His, his prose is extremely ring, really rings on the page. But I think the way to drive it home is really to point today to countries where those liberties are not, are, are being infringed upon, where people are not enjoying those kinds of liberties, and where there is the kind of overreach to which a revolutionary America was reacting. Can, can you talk a in, in general, about the role of the press during this period, you know, you mentioned the average. You mentioned the advertiser, Benjamin Franklin, of course, had had a newspaper, newspapers, and there were many others. Just talk in general about the importance 
of newspapers. And of course, you know, looking at today, newspapers are in a very different place. But talk about the importance and the role that newspapers played during this uh, pre-revolutionary period. It's utterly paramount. And it points up in part why Boston is so much out in front of other towns in, in the colonies at this time. And there's a wonderful um, line from a very frustrated Crown officer where he essentially says, how do you, how are you expect to, to have any kind of order in a colony where you have five newspapers? Um, <laughs> it is this very disruptive, independent press. It is, the, it is the absolute bane of the existence of the Crown officials. Um, it is bristling with sedition from the years really beginning with the Sugar and Stamp Acts through um, the early 1770s. It's uncontrollable. It's insistent. It's extremely popular. The Boston Gazette, which is really the most popular of the papers and the one for which Adams writes most regularly, is read by most of the town, much to the dismay of, of Crown officers. And so the dissemination of ideas, you have an extremely literate colony, you have a very, very healthy news system, and the dissemination of ideas is therefore electrifying and, and extremely easy in, 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 in that realm. Adams benefits from that, benefits from one of the practices of the day and from that system in that it's, a, it's largely a pseudonymous press. Most contributors are writing under pseudonyms. And the availability of those pseudonyms Adams uses something like 30 of them, makes it possible to seem as if it is a legion of people who are writing. Um, so you could read Vindex and you could read Candidus and you could read Alfred, and you didn't realize that in all of those cases you were reading Samuel Adams. So he makes it seem as if the discontent is really general. He can put a different spin on the ball in different pieces. He can use a different tone. He can, he can attack a different individual. But it does feel as if you have this just... Uh, eruption of discontent, even when there's only one man behind it. Do you see any parallel between the Crown's reaction to the press during this period and the reaction of some politicians during the modern era, during the contemporary era, in terms of fake news and enemies of the people and, and so forth? There, there are a lot of, of, of parallels um, in every possible direction. <laughs> Possibly the best case. Um, well, I mean, I think the, the, the most immediate parallel is not so much with the press as with Adams's committees of correspondence, which are these um, essentially committees that he helps to found in all of the towns of Massachusetts and ultimately throughout the colonies who are meant to communicate to each other, who are meant to broadcast to each other about American rights and to, to collectively see that those rights are not infringed. He wants it to, to make, he wants it to be possible for any, um, infringement of rights to, of one to be understood to be an infringement of rights of all because he sees that as the only way to get redress in Great Britain. And those committees of correspondence, when you, when you read through their responses to, for example, the Boston Tea Party, you do feel like you're reading Twitter. They are all using the same language. They're all resorting to the same imagery. It's as if they're retweeting each other's um, remarks. So you, you see it there in the sense of this, um, this just concaphony of voices. There's a lot of misinformation um, fluttering about. Adams is responsible for some of that misinformation. He uses it very effectively once troops arrive. And Boston did not expect to find itself a town occupied by redcoats. In 1768, it is. And Adams does his best to inflame tempers in the town by distributing all kinds of fictitious and pretty lurid accounts of what's going on, not only in the Boston press, but throughout the New York and Philadelphia papers as well. So there is a system there of what we would today perhaps call fake news. Yeah, I, so I uh, spent most of my scholarly career studying uh, the power of information. And one of the things that I learned from your book, Stacy, was just how successful and important a propagandist Samuel Adams was. And I don't say that in a, pejor in a pejorative sense of the word propagandist. He used information for political intent. Do you have a sense, was he innovating and experimenting and seeing what would work and trying different things? Or did he have some theory about the power of information and the flow of information? Because it's not just the committees of correspondence. He has a couple of other efforts where he's trying to spread this, the news of what's happening in Boston throughout the other colonies. Did he have a, an understanding, uh, formal or instinctive, uh, that you were able to discern about the power of information? My guess is that it's largely instinctive but profoundly, um, he's profoundly gifted in all of these realms. 
And, and possibly one of the best illustrations of that is the way in which he's always careful to make the fanatical hot-headed New Englanders take the back seat and let someone else take over. So at various junctures, he will reach out, for example, to a Rhode Islander and say, maybe could you suggest this? Because if it comes from us, you know that it's going to be shot down immediately. And that, that kind of behavior continues in at the first and second Continental Congresses when the Virginians are always charged with doing things because it's always understood that the New Englanders are, are way out in front of everyone else and far too radical, whereas those more decorous Virginians should perhaps put an idea forward. And Adams is behind a lot of those efforts. But I, I think it's an instinctive feel for um, how to propel these things forward. I mean, one of the most amazing things about him is his capacity for patience and temperance. He's a very prudent revolutionary, and he is very careful when necessary to bide his time. He isn't, he, he's by no means advocating violence. He, he really feels that time is on the, on the American side and that often it is best to just wait something out. And that's not, I think, the idea that we initially have of him. So Stacy, he grew up with some means, but he was poor as an adult. Did that shape him and his thinking? And, and if so, how, how did that affect him, his economic circumstances from beginning of his life toward later years? I think it, it shapes him profoundly. I think someone who winds up largely indigent and who, but who didn't begin that way is a very, very different person from someone who was, you know, used from an early age, used to deprivation of some kind. Um, it is a badge of honor with him. His there's something pure in his mind about his poverty, um, which he does nothing whatsoever to. He makes no attempt whatsoever to improve on his on his material position in life. He grows up in a in a very beautiful home. And most importantly, he has the, the family has the means to send him to Harvard for not one but two degrees. So you have an extremely well-educated person who, unlike his peers, um, finds no career, does not has no investment in any kind of industry, gives himself entirely to politics, which is something one didn't do in the 18th century, especially in, in an industrious, aspirational town like Boston. So he has all of this education and he has all of these contacts among the educated elite. And yet he is comfortable and often in the streets of Boston. So in addition to his other talents, he has this ability to sort of connect different parts of the town, different parts of a very hierarchical society. But there is an insistence um, throughout his life on the poor man being the man who had no vested interest, um, a politician who was coming to his, to his office without any kind of business interest was by definition likely to act in the interests of the people as opposed to a politician who had his own fortune to protect. And it's and he, he writes a, a sort of endearing letter to his wife at one point from Congress in which he talks about how he's learned to give up, as he, as he says, the, the sort of sweeter things in life for the sake of his country. But then he catches himself because he realizes that, that that sounds boastful and he sort of tries to walk it back. But that was very much the attitude, was the sense of self-sacrifice, um, which I think is something we've of which we've lost sight entirely today. Did, did he bemoan his poverty toward the end of his life or, or did he wear it as a badge of honor or, or how, did he, how did he come to grips with that or how did he present himself? I think very much as a badge of honor. Um, he lives in a very shabby home. He, he dresses shabbily enough that when he in fact is dispatched to the First Continental Congress, the town of Boston will see to it that a um, chest of clothes is delivered to his doorstep because clearly Massachusetts didn't care to be represented by someone who, who dressed as poorly as did Samuel Adams. Um, so in this kind of fairy tale moment, a, a wig maker and a tailor and a shoemaker will call on his call at his door and take his measure and refuse to say who sent them and then deliver this new wardrobe with which he travels to Philadelphia. But it's it's clearly something on which he prides himself insofar as he goes in for pride, which he doesn't often. And then there's a sort of uncanny twist at the end of his life. Um, his son is killed, son, his son dies, and um, his army pension accrues to Samuel Adams. So finally, at the end of his life, because of this terrible loss, he actually inherits some money. Wow. Uh, you know, Stacy, uh, you mentioned the power of Samuel Adams' words. Uh, some of your words really struck me uh, as I was reading as well. Uh, describing one of Adams' core beliefs, you wrote, a corrupt people would not long remain free. What was he worried about? He, early on, is looking not so much to Great Britain as he is to 
the Crown officials in Boston, the entrenched elite in Boston, the few families, he calls them the haughty families, who really among them have distributed all of the titles in town and all of the administrative tasks and all of and who control all the fortunes. And he feels that there is at a very basic level a corruption there, or there are collusion there, and that American interests are going to be compromised by this very tight oligarchy, which has its kind of which has which controls everything. And he's and, and to, to him that is in a funny way the obvious face of tyranny. And he makes that in a very personal way the face of despotism. So that is really what he's guarding against. He doesn't feel that um, that any of these people, many of whom hold multiple titles, and in particular Thomas Hutchinson, who's acting governor, lieutenant governor, then acting governor, and then governor, who has a multitude of titles. How is it possible for one person, asks Adams, to serve in several branches of government and to do so honorably? And at the same time, in Thomas Hutchinson's case, for example, to be profiting from the tea trade. All of those things tangled together can't possibly yield a public official who has the public's interest at work. And there's a wonderful line of his where he where he essentially says, to have a villainous ruler imposed on you is a misfortune, but to elect one yourself is a disgrace. Ugh. I mean, he really feels it is, in the, it is up to the people to be able to make these kinds of adjustments and to wisely find someone who has, has the public, um, has the commonweal um, at heart as opposed to his own private interests. In, you know, in contrast to so many of the founders, he refused to own a slave. What do you take from that? There are a number of um, encounters in the papers of Adams with anti-slavery petitions. He was clearly the person to whom you went if you were trying to launch, in the 1760s even, if you were trying to launch some kind of um, petition against the slave trade. Adams was very, very central to several of these discussions. At his second marriage, his former mother-in-law um, gives the couple, attempts to give the couple a slave as a wedding present, which was a not unusual gesture at the time. And Adams balks um, and says that this woman, Surrey, may come to live with them, but she must be free if she's going to live in the household and arranges for her emancipation. And indeed, Surrey lives with them for many decades as a close member of the family. But Adams is firm in that position. Um, it'll come up several times over the course of the next years. Um, actually, in the wake of the Boston Tea Party, one of the towns, Medfield, Massachusetts, will write to Boston and say, you know, all of this, all of this activity on behalf of liberty is brilliant, but how can you possibly take this stand and still engage in, in, in pulling people away from their, from their lives and enslaving them? Um, and Adams later will um, hesitate to ratify the Constitution, largely because it doesn't, it, it fails to include a Bill of Rights. And one of the things he feels that the Bill of Rights should guarantee is an end to the slave trade. So here's a question that um, I'd like to ask you. If Samuel Adams could come back today, what would he think of America? Well, I think, first of all, any 18th century figure would be um, rather staggered by the idea of political parties, um, which was really not on the agenda anywhere. I think in Adams's case in particular, and by and, and you know there was plenty of divisiveness, but the idea of parties would have been just staggering. In Adams's case in particular, um, I think income inequality would have been the the most difficult thing to digest. Um, that was so much baked into his idea of what made democracy work. Um, that there should be a commonality of interest. That there should be um, that there should not be an entrenched elite. That privilege should step aside. Um, to make room for genius and industry, that education in particular um, should be available to everyone. And in that case, he, he's very clear about the fact that he includes both boys and girls in that statement, but that education was meant to be both a great gate to opportunity and a great leveler. So I think looking at a world that in many ways resembles his in the sense of a tight elite, um, billionaires who feel they can um, buy communications services, I think those kinds of things would have shock, would shock. Hey, Stacy, you, uh, we're just about out of time here. We got about a minute and a half left, 
But one of the things that I, I loved about this book was that I thought it also provided real insights into the experience of the Crown officers, particularly Thomas Hutchinson and the challenge that they faced because of the threat of violence against their own person. Um, what, 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 what should we in the modern era take from uh, that experience when we think about uh, the threat of violence in American politics today, which seems uh, reborn in a lot of respects. And we're, we've got about uh, you know a minute left here. So you'd like me to solve this problem in yeah. one minute or, or 60 or seconds, so. please. Yes. So, so I, I guess the one thing I would want to say on that front, and yes, if you want to hear that Samuel Adams was the most wanted man in America, you read what the Crown officials had to say about him because they're just, they just can't believe what this man is doing. Um, I think the problem that they all face is a very familiar one, which is that to clamp down with any authority is only to incite. And so they're walking a very, it's a very delicate balance in the sense that to in any way invite troops to Boston, to punish Boston, to um, in any way attempt to corral this resistance is only to fuel it further. And, and I'm sure there's some kind of lesson there about hitting the right notes, but you can draw you know, a very, a fairly um, straight line between the troops occupying Boston and the Boston massacre, between um, the, punishment for the destruction of the tea and the reaction at the first continental congress it's these overreactions in it uh, which all, which very often provoke more than they in fact appease stacy we need way more than 30 minutes to talk to you about all of this stuff thank you so much for being with us she's stacy schiff the book is the revolutionary and it's exceptional that's all the time we have this week but if you want to know more about story in the public square you can find us on facebook or visit pellcenter.org we can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square. <laughs>